We want to welcome folks to Adams, Tennessee, as we remember the 200th anniversary of the death of John Bell. The Bell family, as we well know, we have members here, at least one, that are prominent today, uh, and they're still prominent. Uh, I will say this, it looks, if you read Ingram's book, as if John Bell's health was really declining in the year 1820. And it was on the 19th day of December, they let him sleep longer, according to what I read this morning, just not because of his age and his health. But then they became concerned when breakfast came and went and he still hadn't gotten up. And when they went to check on him, in particular Dewey, Drury rather, uh, he couldn't wake him. He was possibly in a coma at that point. So they called Dr. Hobson at Port Royal, which is over the hill about six miles. And of course, Dr. Hobson did come and um, found him to be, uh, have had poison in his system as best he could tell. There was a vial near his body and his breath smelled like the poison in that vial, which was not the medicine that Dr. Hobson had prescribed some days before. Now, this is where the legend drops in. They believe, or they taught, or they thought. Kate supposedly spoke up and said, I gave him a dose of that medicine and he'll never get up out of that bed again. So he dies on the 20th day, which was 200 years ago of December, and was buried back over behind us about a mile up in the woods. And it, of course, changed the course of history here. He was 70 years old, which was quite a surprise to me. He had a 30-year-old son named Jesse, and he had a seven-year-old son named Joel, and he had nine children altogether. And evidently, uh, they're varied in between. Only the one that, only one that had passed in 1820 was Benjamin. The rest of the children were alive. And of course, Lucy lived another 16 years. tobacco. So I got into his inventory and this is dark air cured tobacco and he had 421 pounds of tobacco in his inventory in January of 1821 when they were doing his inventory. He was a cooper which is a barrel maker, a hogshead maker and uh, he had his tools. They're all lined up. Seemingly Jesse took that interest, his oldest son, and he bought the the uh, stays for the barrels and hogsheads were nothing more than a supersized barrel in case you don't know what a hogshead is and it would go from 1100 to 2000 pounds of tobacco could be if it was in the right state of case or right order they could store it in there compress it roll it up on a wagon or take it down to the river and ship it to new orleans so i found this on the road this morning i thought this is what was supposed to happen dark fired tobacco when 1848 when i found john bell's papers. He sold 10,000 pounds of tobacco to McKendridge in Clarksville to be shipped in the spring of 1849. Uh, that's a lot of tobacco. In those days, four or 500 pounds to an acre was really good in this area. So he would have had 20 plus acres. John Bell may have had an acre or more and he may have already sold some tobacco, but that's all he had in his inventory at the time of his death. Uh, he did not have a will. And I don't know why, but he didn't. State of Tennessee required that the widow receive one third of his land, which was 106 and two thirds acres. She had to buy back her dishes, her household utensils, and uh, everything, beds. The only thing Betsy, her youngest daughter bought was a special bed, which she paid $25 for. I don't know what it had or why it was so expensive because most beds sold between two and $10 a piece. So she must have had something special. And that's all she bought. Now, the other children bought various items. The most expensive horse, and there was four, sold for $106, and it was bought by John Bell Jr. Lucy bought the next expense, most expensive horse, there was four of them, for $60. And then I forgot who bought the other two horses. There was approximately 30 head of cattle. Understand, their four-wheel drive tractors were steers. And that's who, what, what pulled their... their um, plows and whatever they had, drags, and uh, hired out the tobacco with uh, steers. They would have a team of steers. And so he had 30 head of cattle. Some of them I'm sure were females and he may have had some calves. He had at least 150 hogs, that blew my mind. And they had just killed hogs less than a month before he died because that's one of the last trips he made out of the house uh, was to pick the hogs that were to be killed, probably in late November 
We are tickled to death to think that we're able to celebrate his memorial today, share it with his family and those that so enjoy the legend and the stories. As you're well aware, there's been some 40-odd books and more written about John Bell. Most of them repeat, as, as Bo says, but they're still written. And thousands and thousands of articles in newspapers, which Bo has showed me a lot of them. And uh, that's why today it's still probably as popular as ever. I believe there was something like 14,000 sites on, on YouTube when I looked one time. And I don't know how much stuff's on Facebook. We have Jay Webb, who is a descendant of Jesse Bell. We're tickled to death to have him in Adams, Tennessee today. We'd hope to have somebody from Joel, but we're glad he's here. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy uh, seeing us. And I don't know if Jay has anything he wants to say or not. But oh, the only thing I'd like to say is that I appreciate the welcoming to come here to um ride around with you tim yesterday and show me everything show me john's grave show me jesse's grave john jr's um i enjoy every little every detail of the stories the the memories that come about and i remember growing up as a child hearing about the stories and just everything that uh, I mean, just like the fondest memory that I have is that if something happens in the house or something, something gets knocked over or something comes up missing, oh, there's Kate messing with us again and all. It's just... It's, Tell them how far just, back to the bell name. It was your what? Uh, so John Sr. is my sixth great-grandfather. And through Jesse... And, and then Jesse, James Mild Drew. James Mild Drew. And then I, then um, Mary Lou. Mary Lou is my grandmother. Wow. She's James Mild Drew's daughter? Daughter. Wow. Yeah. So he, he's really almost skipped a generation there. It's six generations deep. Yeah. We're yeah. so glad to have him. We have had people. I've been involved with it for over 25 years. And we've had people from California to the East Coast all the way to Florida that came and have come to visit with us and they have little stories some of them know little let me tell you one thing about this cemetery right here this was built in eight, 1957 leslie covington jr who was a multi multi-millionaire came back to the area adams Sattersville. actually he lived out his life up here in adams he went to georgia in 1957 he was a was a I guess in his own right an engineer but he built houses he had this drawn on paper the obelisk and everything he wanted in here he went to the uh with a query the granite in Atlanta where it is down in Georgia oh, Everton Georgia he told the man that was out there cutting these stones and making stuff what he wanted he says we can't do it he says you can he says we can he says you will he said I won't so Mr. Covington goes around to the front office and buys the debt gum company. Comes back and tells the man, now build it, cut it, fix it the way I want it. So they shipped it up here by truck, of course. And I don't know when he sold the company. But that's the way. Leslie did not take no for an answer. He was, uh, his mother was a, was a Bell. He was a grandson of John Bell Jr. And so as I've told this young man up here that is a descendant, many and most of the Bell descendants were fairly well to do and have been very successful. Anybody else want to say something? Dr. Barker, do you like to make some comments in front of the camera? Sure, I'll step up here just to say, uh, and, and if you all don't want to be put on the spot, Jeff and Gray, that's fine. But um, one of the things that's most fascinating to me as someone who is interested in legends across a great swath of the southern portions of the United States is the staying power of this particular legend. So here we have Mr. Tim, a local historian. And just today I shared with Mr. Tim the previous local historian, Mr. Ralph Winter's interviews. So uh, in 50 years, we have interviews from 1972 in the car right now. Wow. So in 50 years, what has happened is that this town has represented its own history to its itself in a way that powerfully reminds people the importance of the past. And so I think it's indicated by Mr. Jay, who's here, and Mr. Greg and Mr. Jeff, who are also here, who aren't maybe descendants, but know of the legend. So would you mind if I asked how you came to learn about the legend, Jeff and Greg? We used to drive up 
uh, to Southern Illinois and pass a road sign saying Bell Witch Cave, Bell Witch whatever, and we our curiosity got up. And Greg, of course, reads about everything printed, so he's he uh, is pretty much a historian on his own, and he knew a lot of the stuff about it. So nice. So ahead, you, you're in Illinois now, right, Jim? No, no, we're we're out of Georgia. We're, out of Georgia. Yeah, okay. we're out of Georgia, but we uh, we used to have to travel to Illinois for business when we were kids. My parent, my dad, bought a bunch of farmland in Illinois. Okay, okay. So we, what part of Georgia? Northeast Georgia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Clayton area. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, a couple of years ago, I mentioned to Jeff uh, on December 20th, I said, you know, in two years, it's going to be the 200th anniversary of John Bell's death. It was a Bell witch fame, which I've heard of since I was a kid. And so we decided right there that uh, we would come up for it. And here okay. we are. Wow. Well, I just think that I just, I just, I'm still blown away with how special that is. You got people like Mr. Bo and Mr. Tim who know more about it than anybody on the planet, but then the rest of us are still thinking about it all the time. <laughs> I would be remiss not to mention Sharon Bell Hamilton, who is a descendant of, of Jesse, who uh, actually was preparing for this moment like months ago, and I kind of backed off. I said, it's going to be Christmas, and we're going to have family, and she said, please help me, please help me, Tim. And, of course, you know the rest, COVID, which we thought would be gone by now. Uh, she's a caregiver in Conway, Arkansas. She's a special lady. She has tremendous knowledge of the family, and she wanted to be here today. And I meant to, to mention her to the beginning with because she is my the reason I came in became involved is because of Miss Sharon, and uh, we kind of bounce off of one another because she finds something new, I find something new. We're finding pictures of family we didn't know existed, and we're looking for more. And we love the stories. And after 25 years, I'm addicted, and she's been addicted longer than I have. I found out she'd been to Adams many times before, I had pictures of this cemetery before she started coming back here now. Bo, you want to say something? Bo has uh, got, probably got more artifacts for the Bell family in, the, in, in general than anybody, at least in Robertson County. And uh, he is a tremendous collector. He has stories and he has everything. If you want to know something about Robertson County, if you want to see some artifact, especially tobacco, Bo has nearly everything you can, can name from a tobacco patch, all the way down from hogs, heads to barrels to uh, tobacco sticks, you name it. And we're trying to educate Brandon. We're going to make him into a tobacco farmer before we're through with him, I think. <laughs> Are you all right? Okay. Anybody got a question that we could... Uh, Maybe ask somebody. We are tickled to be here. Have you ever heard of any Bell Witch stories since uh, the 100th uh, memorial? We have quote unquote new stories all the time. I had just gotten onto the board of the Bell's farm. We have about 260 acres left of John Jr.'s land and some of John Sr.'s. Wish we could get it all back, but it would be a little too expensive right now. I had just gotten on the board. And I get a call. Somebody has knocked the gates down going into Bellwood Cemetery and has hit the second gate. And those two blocks are missing, were missing over there, knocked down, and they had to replace them. He was going to commit suicide by hitting this obelisk and let it fall on him. But he got hung up and hit on top of some tombstones instead and then decided he wanted to live. That was my first encounter with the Bell Board. We've had some other weird things, but that was the probably the weirdest thing I've had. And then, then not long after I got on the board, we're having a meeting about buying a piece of land in the middle of John Jr.'s farm. It was 100 acres for sale. We wanted it. Well, we got through and realized it was going to cost way too much, like a million dollars for 100 acres. So uh, I'm talking to the owners, and they said, well, we've got a stone in our barn, and I want you, Tim, I want you to come and check this thing out. And I said, well, I'm sure wanting to see it. He said, I got a flashlight. Let's go right now. We cleaned the red clay and the dust off of it. It's inside of a barn in Sadlersville, and it was none other than Richard Williams Bell's tombstone, over six feet tall. They had taken it out of the cemetery to reback it because it had broken in half. And when they put the slabs like this right here, some of these slabs on the back of it, it was too heavy. I guess they couldn't get it out of there. So uh, we eventually did get it out. We still haven't got it back where it's supposed to be, but it stayed in my truck for two years. No, long, no sooner than we had got that, I get a call from Bob Bell in Springfield at Austin Bell Funeral Home. 
He says, Tim, be up here in the morning to meet a lady. She has got a bell tombstone, and I want you to take care of it because I'm busy. So I drive up there, and in the parking lot at Austin Bell Funeral Home is a lady with a tombstone propped up against her truck. It's in two pieces. And it's Mary Allen Bell Coke, who is the daughter of John Bell Jr. She was only about 20-something years old when she died, maybe 22 or 24. And uh, she had died after the birth of her second child, which actually lived. His name was John Bell Coke. And the family uh, eventually moved to Guthrie. But anyway, she died, and they buried her out there beside her mother and daddy. And her oldest baby had, well, maybe second baby, died, and they buried them on top of one another. So that was an interesting story. Now we had the stone. Put that in my truck and drove it around for a couple of years. I said, Bob, we got to get this thing somewhere out of my truck. I can't just keep driving tombstones around. So we know that <clears throat> that we uh, that he has the stones. And then uh, the last thing to happen, which was five years ago, Bob calls me one day after school. I'm working at Joe Burns High School. And he says, get up here to Springfield. We're digging Joel Bell and his family up. And I said, Bob, I'm tired. He said, you get up here and you get up here now and you bring your camera. So they were just digging up Joel when I got there and the glass was still over the top of him and they called Bo back here. Bo's got a hundred pictures of it too. And uh, of course, what happens in a grave, it smushes. And there were pieces of his skull, pieces of his leg, femur bones, and just a few other bones, but mostly he had deteriorated. And there were pieces of walnut, if I remember correctly, Bo. Now the coffin was walnut. Not, it, it had de deteriorated down to little, maybe foot long sections. And right beside him, unbeknownst to Bob, was his son, Joel Egbert Jr. His tombstone had fallen backward in the grave. Bob didn't know it was there until he got to digging. It was in pristine condition. And, and some of his, his body parts were still there too. But the older graves, it was nothing but dark spots. Do you remember it that way, Bo? They had completely deteriorated. The, these uh, coffins had deteriorated and you could just see a black spot. And they scooped that up, put it in a bag, marked it and brought it over here and buried it right over there across uh, along the tree line. The teeth. The teeth, we got the teeth in the museum. If anybody wants to see Joel Bell's false teeth, I did not want them, but Bob wanted them in there. And we got his wife, his second wife, uh, one of her set of false teeth, and I think the other one's being studied by some dentist somewhere, supposedly. Now, the, you said very near the tree line. Are they in marked graves over there? Well, he's got it drawn out, and he's got the tombstones for them, but got distracted, and we haven't got them over there. But I, Why weren't they buried here? Well, there's not much room left in here, and there was 11 or 13 of them. He wanted them to get together. Uh -huh. They're still burying a few folks in here. Bo, you've come to a funeral, too, where they buried in here, haven't you? But they, the Covington. mostly the Covingtons who buried into the Bell family, but they're Bells. Dr. Joel Thomas Bell's over here and his son's right beside him. He's actually the first to be buried here in 1879, I think. And you can see his original white stone behind his original stone over where they broke it off. This was, it was not possibly, a, I asked Carney Bell, Bob's daddy, were they buried in perfect lines like this? And he looked at me and grinned. He said, no, but Mr. Covington had to have them perfectly spaced. So some of the stones may not be exactly on top of the right grave, but they're they're here. They're representative. So that's the way it is. I've talked too long, probably. The descendants of the males are over there, and they're on plots. That's Joel's the family's over there, right? That's, that, that's all males. I thought there were different all. different parts of that yeah. were different the bells. Um, but I said they got stuff. The Bell plots are over there, and the Covington plots are over here. Covingtons are buried over here. And send us there up. Bell, this is the Bell line. The main road ran behind Bo and uh, Dr. Barker, and right through where our cars are, and went through the field, and that was a house right over there in that woods called the, the uh, Bell Bats House. And he had been the mayor of Adams, and I said, Bell Bats? I didn't think the Bats and Bells got along. He said he was kin to them on both ways. His mother was uh, a Williams, and Lucy Bell was a Williams, and was a sister. His ancestor was a sister to Lucy. And he was proud of the Bell name, so they called him Bell Bats. And he is buried up uh, on the Baptist Hill, up in the cemetery up there. That house was buried. Don't ask me why they did it that way. There's two or three houses on the farm. They literally dug a hole, took a bulldozer and pushed the houses over in it and covered them over. And that was one of them right there. That happened in the last 20, 25 years. Because I remember it when I was in high school. The bus ran right through the farm here 
and came out over on Johnston Springs Road. Tim, you remember anybody going in there looking for artifacts in the past 25 years? And not even me, but I, I, I need to. I'd love to go over there and metal detect because you got to, there's got to be something around there. Next time I come, I'm coming with metal detect. <laughs> we may get put in jail, but we may do that. <laughs> Dr. Joel Thomas Bell's house was on this side of the cemetery, I assume facing toward that road because 41 came through in 1928 and they abandoned this little strip of road. Every spring, the daffodils come up right over there in that fence row, which they tell me was where the old house was. So he buried his son literally in the side yard or backyard of the house. And of course, the road went on through in front of Bell School and curled up through town. And the other end went out at Justice Springs. You also like to tell them the tree line is the tree line out here. Everything from the tree line back, you have to be a Bell or a Covington or, or right. into the Bell family. And, and it's no, this is all private. And no, no upright stones back, back over there. Yeah, there's hundreds of people buried out there. But they they've got flat stones as you can see. But if you, you if you're a bell, you can be buried with an upright stone. And you and you can be buried with three lines back. Yes, sir. On both sides. Uh technically the Covingtons most of them are kin, but some of them may just be by kin to the Covington side, but they can be buried here and are buried in here. So to be buried back here you need to have a name change. Well, I, I say technically my buddy over here could be if he wanted to be. But I noticed Bob's family is buried outside the wall, and he's the last real bell in the county carrying the name that I know of. And his family and his daddy and his granddaddy and great-granddaddy, I think, are all buried over here on this side. Yeah, that's the family plot. But there are, there are yeah. places for other bell members. But, yeah. for instance, uh, Richard had his own cemetery, and, uh, and that's what we brought back over here. And, no, I'm sorry, he's, he, Richard was buried back there with John Sr., his daddy. And... Uh, some of the others are scattered around. John Jr. has got a cemetery back here about a half a mile in the field. And Joel's was dug up. They dug Joel up and uh, and moved him up here from almost yeah. Springfield. Uh, he, he married into a fairly wealthy family and lived a fairly long life. He was born in uh, 1813. He died in 1890 and uh, was buried up there. Museum, I'll unlock it. We actually have a film in there that we showed that was made about uh, 12 years ago, and I'm proud of it. It's been on YouTube, it's still on YouTube, I guess. Uh, Bo's in it, I think. <laughs> and I just saw one the other day, Bo's in it, his mama's in it. I forgot we made that one. Your mama did a good job. Hey, I got a quick question. Yes, sir. Do the locals believe that Bellwitch really existed? You know, it was a real hot topic. You remember what happened when we had the first year play in 2002? The church got up on its hind legs, and the preacher would have nothing to do with it, and it was like, the town was split about 50-50. I went to church in Kentucky, which saved my hide, but I was involved with it. I was vice president of the play, so I got away with it, but uh, a lot of the local folks took heat. Now, at the present time, it's basically accepted by most people, and the preacher now is involved with the play every year, so they've got a different preacher. Things change. <laughs>